My name is Kyle Redhawk, and this happened to me back in 1994. I was living in a small town in Montana, working as a forest ranger. The job was quiet, and that suited me just fine. I enjoyed the solitude of the mountains, the smell of pine in the air, and the feeling of being a part of the natural world. It was a peaceful life, until that one summer when everything changed. I had a small cabin nestled deep in the woods, about 20 miles from the nearest town. The cabin wasn't much, but it was home. The place was rustic, with a wood-burning stove, a couple of rooms, and a porch where I could sit and watch the stars at night. The forest was my backyard, and I knew it like the back of my hand. One evening, I was sitting on my porch, sipping a cold beer, when I noticed something strange. The forest had gone silent. No crickets, no owls, nothing. Just an eerie, unnatural silence. I shrugged it off at first, figuring it was just one of those odd moments. But then I heard it, a faint rustling in the trees, like something big moving through the underbrush. I stood up, squinting into the darkness, but I couldn't see anything. The rustling grew louder, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I grabbed my flashlight and my hunting knife just in case, and started towards the sound. As I made my way through the trees, the noise stopped. I stood there for a moment, listening, but all I could hear was the pounding of my own heart. I turned around to head back to the cabin when I heard a low, guttural noise behind me. It wasn't like any animal I'd ever heard before. It was deep, menacing. I spun around, shining my flashlight into the trees, but there was nothing there. Just shadows and darkness. I decided it was time to get back to the cabin. Fast. As I walked, I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see something following me. But the forest remained silent. That night I couldn't sleep. Every little noise set me on edge. I kept thinking about that sound, that deep, unearthly noise. I told myself it was just my imagination, but deep down, I knew something wasn't right. A few days later, I was out on a routine patrol, checking the trails and campsites. It was a hot, muggy day, and I was looking forward to getting back to the cabin and cooling off. As I walked, I noticed something odd. The forest was silent again. No birds, no insects, nothing. I stopped, listening, and that's when I heard it. A faint, distant scream. It was a human scream, full of terror. I broke into a run, heading towards the sound. As I got closer, the screaming stopped, replaced by a low, steady, growling noise. I reached a small clearing and stopped dead in my tracks. There, in the middle of the clearing, was a man. He was lying on the ground, covered in blood. His clothes were torn, and his face was twisted in a mask of pain and fear. I rushed over to him, but it was too late. He was dead. His eyes stared blankly at the sky, and his body was covered in deep, ragged wounds. It looked like he had been mauled by a wild animal, but something about the wounds didn't seem right. They were too clean, too precise. I heard a rustling behind me and turned around, but there was nothing there, just the trees and the shadows. I felt a wave of fear wash over me. I was alone, miles from anywhere, with a dead body and something dangerous lurking in the woods. I radioed for help, but it would be at least an hour before anyone could get there. I decided to stay put, keep an eye on the body, and try to figure out what had happened. As I waited, I kept my knife in my hand, ready for anything. The hour seemed to stretch into eternity. Every little noise made me jump. I kept expecting to see something come charging out of the trees. Finally, I heard the sound of an engine. A couple of my fellow rangers arrived, and I filled them in on what had happened. We searched the area but found no sign of the attacker. The wounds on the body were puzzling. They looked like they had been made by a large animal, but there were no tracks, no signs of a struggle. It was like the man had been dropped there from the sky. The next few days were tense. Everyone in town was on edge, and rumors started flying. Some people said it was a bear, Others thought it was a mountain lion, but I knew it was something else, something that didn't belong in the forest. One night I was sitting on my porch trying to relax when I heard that noise again, 
the low, guttural growl. It was closer this time, coming from the edge of the trees. I grabbed my flashlight and knife and headed towards the sound. As I walked, the growling grew louder, more menacing. I shined my flashlight into the trees, and that's when I saw it. A pair of glowing eyes staring back at me. They were large, too large for any animal I knew of, and they were filled with a cold, malevolent intelligence. I took a step back, my heart pounding. The eyes moved closer, and I could make out a vague shape, tall, hunched, with long, clawed hands. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was humanoid, but twisted, unnatural. I backed away, trying to keep the flashlight steady. The creature stepped into the light, and I got a good look at it. Its skin was gray and mottled, its face a grotesque mask of sharp angles and jagged teeth. It had a human-like body, but it was twisted, elongated, with arms that were too long and legs that bent the wrong way. I wanted to run, but I was frozen with fear. The creature let out a low, rumbling growl and took a step towards me. I knew I had to do something, so I threw my flashlight at it and ran. I didn't stop running until I reached the cabin. I slammed the door shut and locked it, my heart pounding. I could hear the creature outside, moving through the trees, circling the cabin. It let out a series of low, guttural noises, like it was calling to something. I grabbed my hunting rifle from the closet and loaded it. I wasn't sure if it would do any good, but it was better than nothing. I stood by the door, my hands shaking, listening to the creature outside. The noises stopped, and the silence was even more unnerving. I waited, my finger on the trigger, but nothing happened. After what felt like hours, I finally heard it move away, disappearing into the forest. The next day, I reported what had happened to the authorities, but they didn't believe me. They said it was probably a bear or a mountain lion, and that I was just imagining things. But I knew what I had seen. I started carrying my rifle with me everywhere I went. I wasn't taking any chances. A few days later, another body was found. This time it was a young woman, torn apart in the same gruesome manner. The town was in a panic and people started talking about leaving, getting out while they still could. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't just sit around and wait for this thing to strike again. I gathered some supplies, loaded my rifle, and headed into the forest. I was going to find this creature and put an end to it, once and for all. I spent hours tracking it, following its trail through the woods. I found more bodies, animals this time, torn apart and left to rot. The deeper I went, the more I felt like I was being watched. The forest was silent, and every step felt like it was leading me closer to something terrible. As night fell, I set up camp in a small clearing. I built a fire and sat with my back to a tree, my rifle in my lap. I was exhausted, but I knew I couldn't sleep. Not with that thing out there. Sometime in the middle of the night, I heard it. The low, guttural growl coming from the darkness. I stood up, my rifle ready, and shined my flashlight into the trees. The eyes were there, glowing in the darkness watching me. The creature stepped into the light, and I felt a surge of fear. It was bigger than I remembered, more menacing. It let out a low, rumbling noise and started towards me. I fired a shot, but it didn't seem to phase it. The creature kept coming, moving faster now. I fired again, hitting it in the shoulder, but it barely flinched. I knew I had to make a run for it. I turned and ran, the creature hot on my heels. I could hear it behind me, its heavy footsteps pounding the ground. I didn't dare look back. I just ran, dodging trees and jumping over logs, trying to put as much distance between us as possible. I stumbled into another clearing and stopped, gasping for breath. The creature was gone, but I knew it was still out there, watching me. I couldn't keep running forever. I had to make a stand. I found a large rock and climbed on top of it, giving myself a bit of an advantage. I reloaded my rifle and waited. The forest was silent, and the darkness felt like it was closing in around me. Hours passed, and I started to think maybe the creature had given up. But then I heard it, 
the low, guttural growl coming from the trees. The eyes appeared, glowing in the darkness, and the creature stepped into the clearing. It moved slowly, deliberately, like it knew I had nowhere to go. I aimed my rifle and fired, hitting it in the chest. The creature staggered but kept coming. I fired again and again, but it was like the bullets were just bouncing off. The creature reached the base of the rock and looked up at me, its eyes filled with a cold, malevolent intelligence. It let out a low, rumbling noise and started to climb. I knew I was out of options. I took a deep breath, aimed my rifle at its head, and fired. The creature let out a roar and fell to the ground, thrashing and convulsing. I watched as it twitched, and finally went still. I climbed down from the rock, my hands shaking. The creature lay there, its eyes staring blankly at the sky. I took a closer look at it, trying to figure out what it was. It looked like something out of a nightmare, a twisted, grotesque parody of a human being. I radioed for help, and this time they believed me. They sent a team out to retrieve the body, and the whole town was in an uproar. The authorities tried to cover it up, saying it was just a bear attack, but I knew the truth. I never found out where the creature came from or what it really was. Some people said it was a demon. Others thought it was some kind of mutant. I just knew it was something that didn't belong in our world. Life in the town slowly returned to normal, but I could never shake the feeling of unease. I moved away a few months later, unable to live in a place that held so many dark memories. I still think about that summer sometimes, about the creature and the people it killed. I wonder if there are more of them out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next victim. But I try not to dwell on it. I've moved on with my life, but I'll never forget what happened. It's a part of me now, a dark chapter in my life that I'll carry with me forever. And if you ever find yourself alone in the woods and the forest goes silent, listen closely. My name is Elijah Standing Bear, and this happened to me in 1983. I was born and raised in the small town of Wapiti, Wyoming. It's a place where everybody knows everybody, and nothing much happens that you wouldn't hear about by sundown. As a Native American man, I grew up hearing my grandmother's stories about our people and the land. Those stories were always fascinating, but I never gave them much thought. I was more concerned with football and chasing girls than with old legends. My buddy, Julian Redfeather, and I spent most of our free time fishing or hiking around the Absaroka Range. One summer, we decided to camp out near Trout Lake, a secluded spot that promised good fishing and a bit of peace away from the town. Julian and I had been planning the trip for weeks, eager for a weekend without the usual routine. We packed light, bringing only the essentials. Fishing gear, a couple of tents, some food, and enough beer to last us through a lazy couple of days. The first day was perfect. We caught a decent haul of fish and spent the evening cooking over an open fire, talking about nothing and everything. By nightfall, the beer had kicked in, and we were just enjoying the cool night air and the sounds of the wilderness. The trouble started on the second night. Around midnight, we heard something moving in the trees. At first, we thought it was just an animal, maybe a deer or a bear. We were used to the sounds of the forest, so we didn't think much of it. But then the noises grew closer, and it became clear that this was something different. It was too deliberate, too human-like. We called out, thinking maybe it was a lost hiker, but there was no response. Julian, ever the brave one, decided to check it out. He grabbed his flashlight and started towards the noise, telling me to stay put. I watched him disappear into the darkness, the beam of his flashlight bouncing around like a ghost. A few minutes passed, and then I heard a scream. Not a loud, panicked scream, but a sharp, cut-off cry that sent a chill through me. I grabbed my own flashlight and went after him. I found Julian a short distance away, lying on the ground, his face pale and eyes wide with fear. He wasn't hurt, but he was shaking. We need to go, he whispered. Now. We packed up as quickly as we could, not bothering to fold the tents or gather our things properly. As we worked, I felt eyes on me, like something was watching from the darkness. I tried to ignore it, focusing on getting everything into our backpacks. 
We started hiking back to the car, our flashlights cutting through the black night. The feeling of being watched didn't go away. Julian kept looking over his shoulder, and I could see the fear in his eyes. We were about halfway back to the car when we heard it again. Footsteps, but not just one set. It sounded like a group, moving in unison, following us. We quickened our pace, practically running now. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears, and my breath came in short, sharp gasps. Julian was ahead of me, his longer legs giving him a faster stride. I glanced back once and saw them. Figures, dark and tall, moving between the trees. They weren't human. They were too tall, too thin, their limbs too long and spindly. We broke into a full sprint, crashing through the underbrush, not caring about the noise we made. All that mattered was getting to the car, getting away from whatever those things were. The footsteps behind us grew louder, closer. I could hear them breathing, a horrible, raspy sound that seemed to echo through the forest. Finally, we burst out onto the dirt road where our car was parked. Julian fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking so badly he could barely unlock the door. We threw our gear into the back and jumped in, slamming the doors shut. He turned the key, and the engine roared to life. We sped down the dirt road, the headlights cutting through the darkness. We didn't stop driving until we reached town. We didn't talk about what we saw, not until much later. We just sat in silence, both of us too shaken to put our thoughts into words. When we finally spoke, it was in hushed tones, afraid that talking too loudly might make it all too real. Julian described what he saw in the woods, the figure that had followed him. It was tall, impossibly tall, with limbs that seemed to stretch unnaturally. Its eyes were the worst part, he said. Black, empty voids that seemed to suck in all the light around them. He had seen it standing there, just watching him, not moving, not making a sound. We tried to rationalize it, tried to come up with a logical explanation. Maybe it was a trick of the light, a shadow cast by the trees. But deep down, we both knew there was no rational explanation. We had seen something out there, something that shouldn't exist. A few days later, I decided to do some research. I went to the local library and started looking through old records, hoping to find some clue about what we had encountered. What I found was more unsettling than I had expected. There were stories, old stories passed down through generations, about a creature that roamed the woods. It had no name, just a description. Tall, thin, with black, soulless eyes. I talked to my grandmother about it, and she told me it was known as the Tsi Na Tale, which means the stalker in our language. She said it was a spirit, a guardian of the forest, and that those who saw it were marked. Marked for what, she wouldn't say, just that it was a bad omen. I tried to put it out of my mind, but the memory lingered. Julian and I stopped going into the woods, sticking to the safety of the town. But even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. Sometimes, late at night, I would wake up and see those black eyes staring at me from the shadows of my room. Julian didn't fare much better. He started drinking more, trying to drown out the memories. One night he called me, his voice slurred and desperate. He said he could see it, standing outside his window, just watching. I rushed over to his place, but by the time I got there, he was gone. His front door was wide open, and there were no signs of a struggle, just Julian's shoes left neatly by the door. We searched for him for days, but there was no trace. It was like he had vanished into thin air. The police had no leads, and eventually the search was called off. The town moved on, but I couldn't. I knew what had taken him, even if I couldn't prove it. Life went on, but it wasn't the same. I moved away, hoping that putting distance between me and Wapiti would help. But the memories followed me, and so did the nightmares. I would dream of those eyes, watching me, waiting. Sometimes I would wake up and swear I could see a shadow moving in the corner of my room, just out of reach of the light. I tried talking to people about it, but nobody believed me. They thought it was just a story, a figment of my imagination. But I knew better. I had seen it, and so had Julian. And I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, waiting. 
Years passed, and the fear dulled but never completely went away. I got married, had kids, tried to build a normal life. But every so often, I would catch a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye, and the memories would come flooding back. I kept a close eye on my children, warning them never to go into the woods alone. One summer, my son, Aiden, came to me, excited about a camping trip his friends had planned. They wanted to go to Trout Lake, the same place where it all started. I told him no, forbidding him to go, but he was insistent. Teenagers, always thinking they know best. He argued, saying it was just a harmless trip, that I was being overprotective. I couldn't tell him the truth, couldn't burden him with the nightmares that still haunted me. So, I made up a story about dangerous wildlife, about how it wasn't safe. He reluctantly agreed to change their plans, and they went somewhere else. I breathed a sigh of relief, but the fear lingered. As the years went by, I heard whispers of other disappearances, other strange sightings in the woods around Wapiti. People went missing, and no traces were ever found. It seemed that whatever haunted those woods hadn't gone away. It was still there, waiting for its next victim. Now, I'm an old man, and the memories are as vivid as ever. I've learned to live with the fear, to accept that some things can't be explained. But I still keep a watchful eye on the woods, still warn anyone who will listen to stay away from Trout Lake. My name is Elijah Standing Bear, and this happened to me. If you ever find yourself in Wapiti, Wyoming, heed my warning. Stay out of the woods, and whatever you do, don't go to Trout Lake. Some things are better left undisturbed, and some stories are all too real. My name is Elwood Tenorio, and this happened to me back in 1998. I was just a regular guy back then, living in a small town in eastern Oregon. The place wasn't much to talk about, just a scattering of houses, a couple of bars, and a grocery store that doubled as the town's only gas station. I was a mechanic by trade, fixing up old cars for people who didn't have much but needed their wheels to get by. My backstory isn't anything special, but it might help you understand why I found myself in this mess in the first place. I've always been a bit of a loner. It's not that I didn't have friends. I just preferred my own company most of the time. I guess that's why I spent so much time out in the woods. There was this one spot I particularly liked, about ten miles out of town, where an old logging trail wound its way up into the mountains. It was quiet up there, and I could fish in the river or just sit and think. One weekend, I decided to head up there for a bit of camping. It wasn't unusual for me to take off like that, and nobody thought much of it. I packed up my old truck with the essentials, tent, sleeping bag, some canned food, and a cooler of beer. It was late September, and the air was just starting to get that crisp edge to it. Perfect camping weather. I left town around noon and drove up the logging trail until the road got too rough for my truck. From there, it was a couple of miles on foot to my favorite spot by the river. I set up camp and spent the afternoon fishing. The river was alive with trout, and I managed to catch a few decent-sized ones for dinner. As the sun dipped behind the mountains, I got a fire going and cooked up my catch. It was shaping up to be a perfect weekend. That night, after a few beers, I turned in early. I was dead asleep when something woke me up. It was a noise, faint at first, but growing louder. It sounded like someone, or something, was moving around just outside my tent. I sat up, straining my ears to catch any sound. There it was again, a rustling, like something heavy moving through the underbrush. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent just enough to peek out. The fire had burned down to embers, casting long shadows that danced in the flickering light. I couldn't see anything at first, but the noise continued. It was coming from the direction of the river, my first thought was that it was a bear, but it didn't sound quite right. Bears make a lot of noise crashing through the brush, and this was quieter, more deliberate. I slipped out of the tent, moving as quietly as I could. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as I crept towards the riverbank. The rustling stopped, and for a moment there was nothing but the sound of the river and my own breathing. 
Then I saw it. Something standing in the shadows, just beyond the reach of the firelight. It was tall, maybe seven feet, and it moved with a strange, almost jerky motion. I couldn't make out any details, just the outline of a figure. My heart was pounding in my chest as I fumbled with the flashlight, trying to get a better look. When the beam finally hit it, I felt my blood run cold. The thing was human-like, but all wrong. Its skin was pale and looked almost stretched too tight over its bones. It didn't have any hair, and its eyes were large and black, reflecting the light like an animal's. I stood there, frozen, unable to move or even scream. Then, just as quickly as it had appeared, it turned and vanished into the trees. I don't know how long I stood there, staring after it. Eventually, I forced myself to move, backing slowly towards my tent. I didn't sleep at all that night, just sat there with my flashlight and a knife, listening to every sound outside. By morning, I had convinced myself that I had imagined the whole thing. Maybe it was the beer, or maybe I was just seeing things in the dark. I packed up my camp and hiked back to my truck, eager to put some distance between myself and whatever I had seen. On the drive back to town, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that thing following me. But the road was empty, and by the time I got home, I had almost convinced myself that it had been a trick of the light, nothing more. I didn't tell anyone about it, not at first. I mean, who would believe me? I tried to go back to my routine, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. It was subtle at first, just a prickling sensation on the back of my neck when I was out in the woods, or the feeling that there was someone just out of sight. Then things started to go missing around my house. Small things at first, tools from the garage, food from the kitchen. I told myself it was just my imagination, but deep down I knew something was wrong. About a week after the camping trip, I got a call from my buddy, Hank. He was a logger, tough as nails, and not the kind of guy to get scared easily. He sounded spooked, said he had seen something up in the woods while he was out hunting. Something he couldn't explain. When he described it, my blood ran cold. It was the same thing I had seen. We decided to head back up there together, see if we could figure out what was going on. Hank brought his rifle, and I took my old shotgun. I wasn't about to go back up there unarmed. We drove up the logging trail and hiked back to the spot where I had camped. Everything was just as I had left it, but there was an eerie silence in the air, like the whole forest was holding its breath. We spent the day searching the area, but didn't find anything. No tracks, no signs of anyone or anything. By the time the sun started to set, we were both on edge. We decided to set up camp and keep watch, taking turns sleeping and keeping an eye out for anything unusual. It was my turn to watch, sometime after midnight, when I heard it again. That rustling sound, coming from the direction of the river. I nudged Hank awake and motioned for him to be quiet. We both sat there, listening. The sound was getting closer, moving through the brush with that same deliberate motion. Hank raised his rifle, and I gripped my shotgun tighter, my heart pounding in my chest. The figure emerged from the trees, moving towards our camp. In the moonlight, it looked even more terrifying, its pale skin almost glowing, eyes black as coal. It stopped at the edge of the clearing, just staring at us. Hank shouted at it to stop, but it didn't react. It just stood there, swaying slightly, like it was trying to decide what to do next. Then, without warning, it lunged forward. Hank fired, the shot echoing through the trees, but the thing didn't even flinch. It moved so fast, faster than anything I had ever seen. Before I knew what was happening, it was on Hank, knocking him to the ground. I fired my shotgun, the blast hitting it square in the back. This time it let out a shriek, a high-pitched, almost human scream, and turned its attention to me. I fired again, but it was already moving, coming at me with those jerky, unnatural movements. I don't remember much of what happened next. It was all a blur of noise and pain. I remember hitting the ground, my head swimming, and then darkness. When I came to, it was dawn. Hank was lying a few feet away, his rifle still clutched in his hands. He wasn't moving. I crawled over to him, my body aching with every movement. He was dead, his eyes wide open, staring at nothing. 
There were deep gashes in his chest, like he had been clawed by something. I stumbled to my feet, my head spinning, and looked around. The thing was gone, but the memory of its eyes, those cold, black eyes, was burned into my mind. I knew I had to get out of there, get help. I grabbed Hank's rifle and started walking, my legs feeling like they were made of lead. It took me hours to make it back to my truck. I drove back to town, straight to the sheriff's office. I must have looked like hell, covered in dirt and blood, because the deputy on duty jumped up as soon as he saw me. I tried to explain what had happened, but I could see the doubt in his eyes. Who would believe a story like mine? They sent a search party up into the mountains, but they didn't find anything. No sign of Hank, no sign of the creature. They chalked it up to a bear attack, said Hank must have gotten too close to a mother with cubs. I knew better, but I kept my mouth shut. There was no point in arguing. I moved away from that town not long after. Too many memories, too many questions. I settled in a small town in Montana, far away from those woods. I still go camping, but I stick to well-traveled areas, places where there are other people around. I never told anyone else about what happened, not in detail. It's not the kind of story you tell if you want people to think you're sane. But sometimes, late at night, I think about that thing. About those eyes. I wonder if it's still out there, somewhere in the woods, waiting. I wonder if it's found someone else. I hope not. But in my heart, I know it's just a matter of time. So that's my story. Believe it or don't, it doesn't make much difference to me. I know what I saw, what happened to Hank. I just hope that whatever it was, it stays far, far away from me. My name is Awan Stone, and this happened to me in 1985. I was living in a small town in northern New Mexico, a place so quiet you could hear the wind whistle through the old abandoned silver mines. I was 25 back then, working as a mechanic at a local garage. Most days were uneventful, filled with oil changes and brake jobs, but I liked the simplicity of it. I lived alone in a small cabin about 10 miles out of town. The cabin had been in my family for generations, and I liked the solitude. I spent my weekends fishing or hiking in the nearby mountains. Life was simple, predictable, and I liked it that way. One weekend, my cousin Jonah, who was a few years younger than me, came to visit. Jonah was a college student in Albuquerque, studying anthropology. He had a knack for getting into trouble and always had wild stories about his adventures. He arrived late on a Friday evening, carrying a backpack full of books and a grin that suggested he had something up his sleeve. Hey, Awan, Jonah said as he dropped his bag on the floor. You ever hear about the skinwalker legends around here? I rolled my eyes. Jonah, you know those are just stories. Elders used to scare kids. Nothing to it. Jonah leaned in, eyes gleaming with excitement. I found something in one of my books. There's supposed to be a cave not far from here with some old petroglyphs that might be connected to the legend. We should check it out. I sighed, knowing there was no talking him out of it. Jonah could be persistent, and I figured a hike wouldn't hurt. We planned to head out the next morning after breakfast. Saturday dawned bright and clear. We packed some supplies and set off into the mountains. The hike was steep, but the scenery was breathtaking. Pine trees stood tall against the blue sky, and the air was crisp and fresh. We trekked for about three hours before Jonah spotted the cave entrance, hidden behind a cluster of rocks. Here it is, he said, excitement bubbling in his voice. We entered the cave, and it was dark and musty. Jonah flicked on his flashlight and started scanning the walls. Sure enough, there were petroglyphs, ancient and weathered but still visible. They depicted strange figures and animals, some of which I recognized from stories my grandmother used to tell. Look at this, Jonah said, pointing to a figure that seemed half human, half beast. This could be a depiction of a skinwalker. I shrugged. Maybe. Or it could just be someone's imagination. We spent a couple of hours exploring the cave, taking pictures, and debating the meanings of the carvings. Eventually, we decided to head back. 
The sun was setting, and I didn't want to be out in the mountains after dark. As we made our way back, something felt off. The forest, usually alive with the sounds of birds and insects, was eerily quiet. Jonah noticed it too, and we quickened our pace. By the time we reached my cabin, it was dark, and we were both on edge. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every little noise outside seemed amplified. Around midnight, I heard what sounded like footsteps outside the cabin. I grabbed my flashlight and went to the window, but saw nothing. I told myself it was just my imagination, spooked by Jonah's stories. The next day, Jonah wanted to go back to the cave. I was hesitant, but agreed. We set out early, and the hike seemed longer this time. When we reached the cave, I had an uneasy feeling in my gut. We explored a bit more, but nothing new caught our attention. We decided to head back earlier, hoping to make it back before dark. As we descended the mountain, the sense of unease grew. Halfway down, Jonah stopped and pointed to something in the distance. Do you see that? He whispered. I squinted and saw a figure standing on a ridge about a hundred yards away. It was tall and seemed to be watching us. Jonah and I exchanged worried glances and picked up our pace. We didn't look back, but I could feel eyes on us the whole way down. That night, the footsteps returned, closer this time. I heard scratching at the door and low, guttural sounds that sent chills down my spine. Jonah and I stayed up, armed with a baseball bat and a kitchen knife, but whatever it was, it didn't try to enter. The following day, we decided to leave the cabin and stay in town until we could figure out what was happening. As we packed, we heard a loud crash from the back of the cabin. We ran outside and found the back door splintered, hanging off its hinges. We didn't wait to see what had done it. We grabbed our things, jumped into my truck, and drove to the nearest motel. That night, we called the local sheriff, Dale Hawkins, a grizzled old-timer who'd been around since before I was born. He agreed to meet us at the cabin the next morning. Sheriff Hawkins didn't believe in the supernatural, but he took our story seriously. He inspected the cabin, noting the damage to the door and the strange tracks around the perimeter. He couldn't identify the tracks, but they were large and unlike anything he'd seen before. I'll keep an eye out, he said, but you boys should be careful. Might be someone messing with you. Jonah and I decided to stay in town for a few days. We tried to go about our lives, but the sense of dread lingered. One evening, Jonah went out to get some supplies and didn't come back. I waited for hours, pacing the motel room, growing more worried by the minute. I called Sheriff Hawkins, and he organized a search party. We combed the area around the motel, but there was no sign of Jonah. I was frantic, fearing the worst. The search continued for days, but Jonah had vanished without a trace. A week later, I returned to the cabin, hoping to find some clue as to what had happened. The place felt different, colder somehow. As I walked through the cabin, I noticed a faint, acrid smell. I followed it to the bedroom, where I found a piece of Jonah's jacket, torn and bloodstained. I called Sheriff Hawkins again, and he arrived with a team to investigate. They searched the surrounding area and found more tracks leading into the forest. We followed them for miles until they abruptly ended at the edge of a cliff. There was no sign of Jonah, but the sense of dread was overwhelming. After that, I couldn't stay at the cabin. I moved into town, but the memories haunted me. Jonah was declared missing, and life went on. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there something that had taken him. Years passed, and the events of that summer became a painful memory, a dark chapter in my life. I still hike those mountains occasionally, but I never go near the cave. The forest is still and quiet, and I sometimes feel eyes watching me from the shadows. I told my story to a few people, but most didn't believe me. They said it was just a wild animal, or maybe Jonah had run off. But I know better. I saw the tracks, heard the sounds, and felt the presence of something ancient and malevolent. To this day, I don't know what we encountered in those mountains. Maybe it was a skinwalker, as Jonah believed, or maybe something else entirely. All I know is that it was real, and it took my cousin. The fear it left behind still lingers, a dark shadow over my memories of those quiet, sunlit days in the mountains. 
I often think back to that summer, wondering if I could have done something differently. Maybe if we hadn't gone to the cave, if we hadn't disturbed whatever was there, Jonah would still be here. But those are questions without answers, lost in the mists of time and memory. The cabin still stands, a silent sentinel in the mountains, bearing witness to the events of that fateful summer. I visited occasionally, leaving offerings of tobacco and sage, hoping to appease whatever spirits dwell there. It's a small gesture, but it's all I can do. Life goes on, but the past is never truly gone. It lingers in the quiet moments, in the shadows of the mountains, in the whisper of the wind through the trees. And sometimes, late at night, I hear the footsteps again, a reminder that some mysteries are never meant to be solved. So, that's my story. I don't expect you to believe it, but it's the truth. Be careful in those mountains, and if you ever find yourself near a cave with strange carvings, think twice before you go in. Some doors are better left unopened, some paths left untraveled, and some stories, like mine, are best left as whispers in the wind. My name is Lewis Standing Bear, and this happened to me back in 1998. I was 32, living in a small town called Shoshone, nestled in the Wyoming Basin. My family was from around here, generations back. We were always close-knit, with traditions and stories handed down like heirlooms. I had a regular job at a nearby ranch, helping out with the cattle and maintenance. It wasn't glamorous, but it paid the bills, and I loved the open skies and the sense of peace that came with the land. One evening I got a call from my cousin, Gerald Tall Elk. Gerald was a bit of an oddball, always had been. He lived out in the sticks, in a cabin that was more than a bit run down. He was always tinkering with old cars and hunting in the off-seasons. Anyway, Gerald had found something strange out in the woods and wanted me to come take a look. He wouldn't say what it was over the phone, just that it was something real weird. I drove out to his place the next morning. The road was rough, gravel crunching under my tires, and the trees seemed to close in around me the further I went. Gerald's cabin appeared through the trees, looking as rickety as ever. He was waiting outside, a cigarette dangling from his lips, his usual scruffy appearance making him look like he belonged out there in the wilderness. Hey, Lewis, he greeted me with a nod. Glad you could make it. What's this about, Gerald? You sounded pretty spooked on the phone. Follow me, he said, tossing his cigarette and motioning for me to follow him into the woods. We walked for about ten minutes, deeper into the forest. The air was cool the kind of chill that gets into your bones. Gerald didn't say much, just kept pushing forward until we reached a clearing. There, in the center, was a patch of ground that looked disturbed, like something had been digging there. Check this out, he said, pointing to the ground. I looked closer and saw what he meant. There were claw marks, deep gouges in the earth. They were too big for a bear or any other animal I could think of. They looked almost human, but not quite. What the hell is this? I asked, feeling a knot form in my stomach. I don't know, but I've been hearing things at night. Weird sounds, like something's out there watching. I found these tracks a few days ago, and they've been popping up all around my cabin. I figured you'd know what to do. Gerald and I decided to set up some cameras around the area, hoping to catch whatever it was that was making those tracks. We spent the rest of the day positioning them and then headed back to his cabin. He cooked up some venison stew, and we sat on his porch, talking about old times and keeping an eye on the tree line. That night, as the wind whispered through the trees, we heard it. A low, strange noise, like a moan but deeper, more guttural. We both grabbed our rifles and stepped off the porch, flashlights cutting through the darkness. The sound was coming from the direction of the clearing. We moved slowly, each step crunching on the fallen leaves. The noise grew louder, more distinct. It was definitely not any animal I knew. We reached the clearing and froze. There, standing over the disturbed earth, was a figure. It was tall, hunched, 
with long arms that ended in those clawed hands we had seen in the ground. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and its eyes glowed faintly in the light of our flashlights. Jesus, I whispered, feeling my heart pound in my chest. Gerald raised his rifle, but before he could fire, the thing turned and disappeared into the woods with incredible speed. We stood there, stunned, trying to process what we had just seen. The next day, we checked the cameras. They had captured glimpses of the creature, enough to confirm we weren't losing our minds. We took the footage to the local sheriff, hoping for some kind of help. Sheriff Whitefeather was a no-nonsense kind of guy, a bit older, with a face that looked like it had seen everything. He watched the footage, his expression unreadable. This is some serious business, he finally said. I've heard stories about things like this, old legends from the elders, but I never thought I'd see something like this. What do we do? Gerald asked, his voice shaky. We need to be careful. If this thing is real, it's dangerous. I'll get a few deputies to keep an eye on the area, but I don't want this spreading around. People will panic. For the next few nights, Gerald and I, along with a couple of deputies, kept watch. The creature didn't show up again, but the feeling of being watched never left us. The woods seemed darker, more sinister, and every snap of a twig set us on edge. Then, one night, Gerald went missing. I arrived at his cabin to find the door wide open, his rifle still by the porch. There were signs of a struggle, and the ground outside was torn up with those same claw marks. We searched for days, combing through the woods, but found no trace of him. It was like he had vanished into thin air. The deputies did what they could, but eventually, the search was called off. People started talking, whispers of curses and ancient spirits. The town grew quieter, and the woods seemed to close in around us. A few weeks later, I was sitting in my living room, staring at the footage we had captured. I felt a deep sense of loss, not just for Gerald, but for the peace we once had. I decided to go back to the clearing one last time. I needed closure, something to help me understand. I drove out there, the sun setting behind the trees, casting long shadows. The clearing looked the same, the disturbed earth still fresh. I stood there, feeling the weight of the past few weeks. Then, I heard it again. That low, strange moan. I turned, my flashlight catching the glow of those eyes. The creature stood at the edge of the clearing, watching me. I raised my rifle, hands shaking, but I couldn't pull the trigger. It felt like it was waiting for something, a message I couldn't understand. Gerald! I shouted, hoping for some kind of response, but there was only silence. The creature moved closer, and I took a step back. It raised one of its clawed hands and pointed to the ground. Then it turned and vanished into the trees. I approached the spot it had pointed to and saw something glinting in the dirt. I dug with my hands, pulling out a small, rusted medallion. It was an old family heirloom, something Gerald always wore around his neck. I stood there, clutching the medallion, feeling a mix of anger and sorrow. Whatever that thing was, it had taken my cousin, but it had also left me a clue, a connection to the past. I went back to town, determined to learn more about the legends Sheriff Whitefeather had mentioned. I spoke to the elders, listened to their stories of ancient creatures that roamed the land, spirits of the forest that were neither good nor evil, but something in between. One elder, Old Man Black Elk, told me about the Wendigo, a creature born of hunger and desperation. It was a cautionary tale, a warning of what could happen when a person lost their way. I didn't know if that was what we had encountered, but it was as close to an answer as I would get. Life in Shoshone slowly returned to normal, but the memory of Gerald and the creature stayed with me. I kept the medallion, a reminder of the strange and terrible events that had unfolded. I still work at the ranch, still love the open skies and the land, but there's a part of me that's always looking over my shoulder, always aware of the shadows in the woods. I don't know if the creature is still out there, or if it was just a figment of our collective fears. But I do know that the world is full of mysteries, and some things are better left unexplored. 
Gerald's disappearance remains unsolved, a dark chapter in our town's history. And every now and then, when the wind howls through the trees, I think of him and the creature, and I wonder if some stories are meant to stay untold. My name is Cassius Trujillo, and this happened to me back in 1983. I was 28, living in a small town called Lone Pine in the heart of Arizona. I worked as a mechanic at Joe's Auto Shop, which wasn't much, but it paid the bills. Most days were predictable, fix a few cars, have a beer with Joe after work, and then head home to my trailer on the outskirts of town. It was a quiet life, and I liked it that way. That was until I found myself in the middle of something I still struggle to explain. It started with a call from my old friend, Everett Little Bear. Everett and I grew up together on the reservation, but he moved away after high school. We kept in touch, though, and he'd visit a couple of times a year. This time, his call wasn't about catching up over a few beers. He sounded panicked, almost whispering into the phone. Cass, I need you to come to my place. It's important. And don't tell anyone you're coming, he said. I hesitated, but agreed. Everett's place was about a three-hour drive north, near the Mogollon Rim. I packed a few things, made sure my truck was gassed up, and hit the road. The drive was uneventful until I turned onto the dirt road leading to Everett's cabin. That's when things got weird. The sun was setting, casting long shadows through the pines. As I drove deeper into the woods, I noticed a strange silence. No birds, no crickets, just the sound of my tires crunching on the gravel. When I finally reached the cabin, it was almost dark. Everett was waiting for me on the porch, looking worse for wear. His face was pale, eyes bloodshot, and he kept glancing nervously over his shoulder. Thanks for coming, Cass. Let's go inside, he said, ushering me into the cabin. Inside, the place was a mess. Papers and books were scattered everywhere, and there were strange symbols drawn on the walls. Everett locked the door behind us and started pacing. Everett, what the hell is going on? I asked, trying to make sense of the chaos. I've been researching something, something old and dangerous, he said. It's a creature, Cass. I think it's called the Wendigo. I laughed, thinking he was pulling my leg. A Wendigo? Like from those old stories our grandparents used to tell? But Everett was dead serious. He handed me a worn notebook filled with his scribblings. It detailed sightings, strange disappearances, and gruesome deaths, all linked to this creature. He believed it was real, and that it was somewhere in these woods. People have been going missing, Cass. I think it's hunting them, he said, his voice trembling. I didn't know what to think. It sounded crazy, but Everett was genuinely scared. He showed me a map with marked locations of the disappearances, all within a few miles of his cabin. Why didn't you go to the police? I asked. They wouldn't believe me. They'd think I was insane, he said. But you? You've seen things, too. You know our people's stories. I nodded, remembering the old legends our grandparents told us. Stories of creatures lurking in the woods, spirits that could possess the living. I never put much stock in them, but Everett's fear was contagious. All right, what do you want me to do? I asked. Help me find it. We need to stop it before more people disappear, he said. Against my better judgment, I agreed. We spent the night preparing, packing supplies, checking weapons. Everett had an old rifle, and I brought a hunting knife. I wasn't much for guns, but I figured it was better to be safe than sorry. The next morning we set out at dawn. The forest was thick and dark, even in daylight. Everett led the way, following the map. We hiked for hours, moving deeper into the woods. As we walked, Everett told me more about his research. He believed the creature was ancient, something that had been here long before any settlers arrived. It feeds on fear and flesh, he said. It can mimic human voices to lure its victims. I shuddered at the thought, but kept moving. The further we went, the more uneasy I felt. The forest seemed to close in around us, the trees towering like silent sentinels. 
We reached a clearing just before noon, and that's when we found the first sign. A set of tracks. Not quite human. Not quite animal. Look at this, Everett said, pointing to the ground. The tracks were large, with elongated toes and deep claw marks. They led away from the clearing, deeper into the forest. We followed them, our senses on high alert. The silence was oppressive, the only sound our footsteps crunching on the forest floor. We reached a small ravine, and that's when we heard it. A faint, distant cry. It sounded human, a voice calling for help. Everett and I exchanged a look. Stay close, he whispered as we descended into the ravine. The voice grew louder, more desperate. We followed it to a cave entrance, hidden among the rocks. Everett motioned for me to stay back as he crept closer. He peered inside, then quickly retreated. There's someone in there, he said. But be ready. It could be a trap. I nodded, gripping my knife. We entered the cave cautiously, the air cold and damp. The voice echoed through the tunnels, leading us deeper underground. Finally, we found the source. A young woman, tied up and gagged, her eyes wide with fear. Help me, please, she begged as we approached. Everett rushed to untie her while I kept watch. The cave was dark, the only light coming from our flashlights. Suddenly, there was a rustling sound from the tunnel behind us. I turned, my heart pounding. Cass, we need to go. Now, Everett shouted, helping the woman to her feet. We hurried back the way we came, but the rustling grew louder, closer. As we reached the cave entrance, a figure emerged from the shadows. It was tall, gaunt, with long, matted hair and eyes that glowed in the darkness. It looked almost human, but not quite. Run, I yelled, pushing the woman ahead of me. We scrambled up the ravine, the creature in pursuit. Everett fired a shot, but it barely slowed it down. We ran through the forest, branches whipping our faces, lungs burning. The creature was fast, too fast. We reached a small cabin, abandoned and dilapidated. I kicked the door open and we rushed inside, barricading it with whatever we could find. The woman was sobbing, and Everett was trying to calm her down. Stay quiet, I whispered listening for any sound outside. For a moment, there was nothing. Then the door shook, and the creature's claws scraped against the wood. It was trying to get in. I gripped my knife, ready to fight. The door burst open and the creature lunged at us. Everett fired again, hitting it in the shoulder. It shrieked, a terrible, inhuman sound, and staggered back. I saw my chance and slashed at it with my knife, but it was like cutting into stone. It grabbed me, its grip like a vice and threw me across the room. I hit the wall hard, pain exploding in my side. Everett fired again, and this time the creature fell. But it wasn't dead. It started to rise, its wounds already healing. Cass, we need to burn it, Everett shouted, throwing me a can of gasoline. I nodded, struggling to my feet. We doused the creature with gasoline and lit it on fire. It screamed, thrashing wildly, but the flames consumed it. Finally, it stopped moving, reduced to a charred husk. We stood there, panting, covered in sweat and soot. The woman was still crying, but she looked at us with something like hope. Thank you, she whispered. We didn't stick around. We helped the woman back to Everett's cabin and called the authorities. They didn't believe our story, of course, but they couldn't deny the evidence. The tracks, the remains in the cave, the burnt corpse we left behind. The woman, whose name was Lisa, stayed with us for a while. She told us she had been hiking in the area when she was taken. She didn't remember much, just waking up in the cave, terrified and alone. Everett and I kept in touch after that, but we never spoke about what happened. It was too unbelievable, too horrific. I went back to my life in Lone Pine but things were never quite the same. I always felt like something was watching me, waiting. Years later, I still think about that night. I think about the creature, the Wendigo, and wonder if there are more out there. I wonder if it's still hunting, still lurking in the shadows. But most of all, I wonder if we'll ever truly be safe.
As I sit here, writing this down, I can't help but feel a chill run down my spine. Not from fear, but from the memory of that cold, dark cave and the creature that almost took our lives. It's a memory that will haunt me for the rest of my days. My name is Tohono Yazi, and this happened to me back in 1993. I was living in a small town called Dry Ridge, Kentucky. Not the most exciting place on the map, but it was home. I worked at a local hardware store, the kind of place where everyone knew each other's name. My buddy, Gabriel Bluefeather, and I used to go hunting every weekend. Gabriel was a good man, always cracking jokes and making light of any situation. One Friday evening, Gabriel came by my place. We were gearing up for another hunting trip, this time to a place called Pine Hollow, a dense forest area about an hour's drive from town. We'd heard rumors about the place, something about people going missing, but we didn't pay much attention. You hear all sorts of stories growing up in a small town. We packed up our gear, grabbed some sandwiches, and loaded up my old pickup truck. Hey, Tohono, you think we'll actually see anything out there? Or is this just another one of your wild goose chases? Gabriel teased as he tossed his bag into the truck bed. Who knows, Gabe? Maybe we'll get lucky this time, I replied, chuckling. Besides, it's not like we've got anything better to do. The drive to Pine Hollow was uneventful, just the two of us talking about old times and the usual banter. By the time we arrived, the sun was starting to set. The forest had an eerie calm to it, but we brushed it off. We set up our camp near a small clearing, got a fire going, and settled in for the night. As the night wore on, Gabriel pulled out a flask from his bag. To good times and bad decisions, he said, raising it in a toast. We laughed and passed the flask back and forth, sharing stories until we were both feeling a bit tipsy. In the middle of the night, I woke up to a strange noise. It wasn't loud, but it was enough to jolt me awake. It sounded like someone was walking around our campsite. I shook Gabriel awake. Gabe, you hear that? He grumbled, still half asleep. What is it, man? Listen, I whispered. We both went silent, straining to hear. There it was again, the sound of twigs snapping underfoot. Gabriel grabbed his flashlight and shone it around the campsite. Nothing. Just darkness and the occasional rustling of leaves. Probably just a deer or something, he mumbled, lying back down. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. The next morning we woke up to find our campsite a mess. Our food supplies were scattered, and there were strange tracks in the dirt. They looked like human footprints, but distorted, almost as if whoever made them had an extra toe or something. Gabriel laughed it off. Maybe Bigfoot paid us a visit, he joked. We decided to press on with our hunting trip, but I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that had settled in my gut. As we moved deeper into the forest, the air grew thick and oppressive. It was as if the trees themselves were closing in on us. Around midday, we stumbled upon an old cabin. It looked abandoned, but curiosity got the better of us. We decided to take a look inside. The door creaked open, and a musty smell hit us. The place was in shambles with broken furniture and debris scattered everywhere. But what caught our attention was a series of strange symbols carved into the walls. They looked like some kind of ancient writing, something I'd never seen before. Creepy, Gabriel muttered. Think we should head back? Yeah, maybe this place isn't as empty as we thought, I replied, feeling a chill run down my spine. As we turned to leave, we heard a loud crash from deeper within the cabin. Gabriel and I froze, our eyes locked on each other. Did you hear that? He whispered. Yeah, I replied, my heart pounding. We should go. We hurried out of the cabin and back to our campsite. The rest of the day passed without incident, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. That night, we decided to keep a watch, taking turns while the other slept. It was Gabriel's turn first, and I drifted off to an uneasy sleep. I woke up to Gabriel shaking me awake, panic in his eyes. Tohono, wake up! 
There's something out there. I grabbed my flashlight and my rifle, my heart racing. We both stood at the edge of the campsite, listening. The forest was deathly silent, not even the sound of insects. Then, we saw it. A figure standing at the edge of the clearing, just beyond the reach of our flashlight beams. It was tall, humanoid, but its limbs were too long, its movements too jerky. Its eyes seemed to glow in the dark. What the hell is that? Gabriel whispered, his voice trembling. I don't know, but we need to get out of here, I replied, backing away slowly. The figure took a step forward and we both bolted for the truck. We could hear it crashing through the underbrush behind us, moving faster than any human could. We jumped into the truck and I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking. Go! Go! Gabriel shouted. The engine roared to life and I floored it, tearing down the rough forest path. We didn't stop until we were miles away from Pine Hollow, the sun starting to rise behind us. We never spoke about what happened that night, not to anyone. Gabriel and I drifted apart after that. He moved to another town, and I stayed in Dry Ridge, but I never went back to Pine Hollow. Years later, I still think about that night. I've heard stories, whispers about a creature that roams the forests, taking those who wander too far. Some say it's an ancient spirit, others call it a demon. I don't know what it was, but I know it was real. And I know I'll never forget the terror of that night in Pine Hollow. Since then, I've tried to live a normal life. I got married, had kids, and settled down. But every so often, I wake up in the middle of the night, my heart racing, and I swear I can hear the sound of twigs snapping outside my window. I know it's probably just my mind playing tricks on me, but I can't help but feel that whatever it was out there, it's still watching, waiting. I've done some research over the years, trying to find any explanation for what we saw. I've come across stories of similar encounters, descriptions that match what we saw almost perfectly. The creature, whatever it is, seems to be part of some old Native American folklore, a guardian of the forest, or perhaps something more sinister. They call it the Wendigo. It's strange, but knowing that there are others who've seen it too doesn't bring much comfort. If anything, it makes it worse. It means it's not just a figment of my imagination. It's something real, something out there. I've warned my kids about going too deep into the woods. They think I'm just being an overprotective dad, but I can't take any chances. I've also kept in touch with Gabriel, though we don't talk about that night. He's got a family of his own now, and I think he's tried to move on, just like me. But I know he hasn't forgotten either. Last year, there was a news story about a group of hikers who went missing in Pine Hollow. The authorities chalked it up to them getting lost, but I know better. I tried to warn them, but no one listens to old stories, not until it's too late. I still go hunting, but never alone, and never in places I don't know. My name is Akacheta Tall Chief, and this happened to me in 1989. I was 25, just getting by in a small town in the Nevada desert called Silver Springs. I worked at a gas station and lived in a rundown trailer on the edge of town. Life wasn't glamorous, but it was mine. Most evenings I'd sit out front, nursing a beer and watching the sunset over the dusty horizon. That's when things started to get strange. It began one hot summer night. My buddy, Elroy Black, came over. We grew up together on the reservation and moved out here when jobs got scarce back home. Elroy was always looking for the next big adventure, the next thrill. That night, he had a wild look in his eyes. Hey, Akacheta, he said, grinning like a fool. I found something out in the desert. Yeah? What'd you find this time? I replied, taking a swig of my beer. Elroy had a knack for exaggeration, so I didn't put much stock in his words. An old mine, he said. But it ain't just any mine. There's something weird about it. You gotta come see. I should have known better, but curiosity got the best of me. We grabbed some flashlights, hopped into my beat-up truck, and headed out into the desert. The drive was long, and the road was rough. Elroy kept rambling about the mine, 
how it didn't look like any other he'd seen. Something about strange symbols carved into the walls. We arrived at the site just as the last light of day disappeared. The mine entrance was half collapsed, hidden behind a tangle of sagebrush and cactus. I felt a chill run through me as we approached. I shook it off, telling myself it was just the cool desert air. Elroy led the way, and we squeezed through the narrow opening. Inside, it was pitch black, our flashlights casting eerie shadows on the walls. Sure enough, there were strange markings, old and faded, but unmistakably deliberate. See what I mean? Elroy whispered, his voice echoing off the stone walls. Yeah, I see it, I replied, feeling an uneasy knot form in my stomach. We ventured deeper into the mine, the air growing stale and heavy. Every now and then we heard faint sounds, like whispers, or maybe the wind. I couldn't tell. Elroy seemed unfazed, but I was on edge. Suddenly, our flashlights flickered and died. We were plunged into darkness. I fumbled for my lighter, trying to stay calm. Elroy, you got a spare battery? I asked, my voice shaking slightly. No, man. This ain't right. We should head back, he replied, sounding genuinely scared for the first time. We turned to leave, but the entrance had vanished. There was just solid rock where the opening had been. Panic set in. We felt our way along the walls, looking for any sign of the way out. That's when we heard it. A low, raspy breathing, like something was in there with us. Did you hear that? Elroy whispered. Yeah, I said, my heart pounding in my chest. We moved faster, desperation driving us. The breathing grew louder, closer. Then, out of nowhere, Elroy screamed. I spun around, but I couldn't see anything. Just darkness, and the sound of Elroy's scream echoing off the walls. Elroy! Elroy, where are you? I shouted, my voice cracking. No response. Just silence. I was alone in the dark, with whatever had taken Elroy. I pressed on, feeling my way through the mine, my mind racing. What was happening? Where was Elroy? After what felt like hours, I stumbled upon a small chamber. There, illuminated by a faint, unnatural light, was Elroy. He was sprawled on the ground, unmoving. I rushed to his side, but it was too late. His eyes were wide open, staring into nothingness. His face was twisted in terror. I didn't have time to grieve. That breathing sound was back, and it was right behind me. I turned slowly, my heart in my throat. Standing there, half hidden in the shadows, was a creature like nothing I'd ever seen. It was humanoid, but grotesque, with elongated limbs and a face that looked half-melted. Its eyes were hollow, and its skin was a sickly gray. I backed away, my mind screaming at me to run, but my legs wouldn't move. The creature took a step forward, its movements slow and deliberate. I finally found the strength to turn and sprint, not caring where I was going as long as it was away from that thing. I don't know how long I ran, but eventually I found myself outside, gasping for air under the night sky. The mine entrance was there again, as if it had never disappeared. I looked back, expecting the creature to follow, but there was nothing. Just the silent desert. I called the authorities, but when they arrived, there was no sign of Elroy. The mine entrance was gone, replaced by solid rock. They searched for days, but they found nothing. Elroy was declared missing, presumed dead. I tried to go back to my old life, but things were never the same. People in town whispered about me, about what happened that night. Some thought I was crazy, others thought I had something to do with Elroy's disappearance. I kept to myself, drowning my sorrows in cheap whiskey. One night, a man named Caleb Crow came into the bar. He was an older native man, with deep lines on his face and eyes that had seen too much. He sat next to me in order to drink. You're Akicheta, right? He asked. Yeah, who's asking? I replied, not in the mood for conversation. I heard about what happened to your friend, he said, ignoring my hostility. I might know something that can help. I looked at him, skeptical. How could you know anything about it? Because I've seen it before, he said, his voice low. 
The creature you saw is called a Yenaldushi. It's a skinwalker, a shapeshifter. It's part of our old stories, but it's real. I wanted to dismiss him as a crackpot, but something in his eyes told me he was serious. So what do I do? I asked, feeling a glimmer of hope. You can't fight it with guns or knives, he said. You need to understand its nature, confront it with courage. Only then can you hope to survive. I didn't know if I believed him, but I had nothing left to lose. Caleb and I spent the next few weeks preparing. He taught me about the old ways, about the rituals and protections. It felt strange, but I was willing to try anything. One night, we returned to the desert, to the place where the mine had been. Caleb set up a circle of protection with sage and blessed artifacts, while I stood guard, flashlight in hand, nerves on edge. The desert was eerily quiet, the kind of quiet that made your skin crawl. Caleb began chanting in a language I didn't understand, his voice steady and calm. I felt a strange energy in the air like something ancient and powerful was waking up. Suddenly, there was a shift, a palpable change in the atmosphere. The entrance to the mine reappeared, flickering into existence like a mirage. I took a deep breath and stepped inside, Caleb's chants echoing behind me. The air was thick and oppressive, but I pushed on, determined to confront the creature that had taken Elroy. I followed the same path we had taken before, feeling my way through the dark, until I reached the chamber where I had found Elroy. The creature was there, waiting. It looked at me with those hollow eyes, its grotesque face twisting into a mockery of a smile. Fear surged through me, but I remembered Caleb's words. I needed to confront it with courage, not run away. You took my friend, I said, my voice shaking. But you won't take me. The creature hissed, a sound that sent shivers down my spine. It lunged at me, but I stood my ground, raising the blessed artifact Caleb had given me. The creature recoiled, its skin burning where the artifact touched it. Go back to where you came from, I said, my voice growing stronger. You have no power over me. The creature howled in rage, but it began to retreat, its form flickering like a dying flame. I pressed forward, driving it back with each step. Finally it disappeared, leaving only a faint, foul smell in the air. I stumbled out of the mine, exhausted but triumphant. Caleb was waiting for me, a look of relief on his face. You did it, he said, clapping me on the shoulder. The Yenaldushi is gone for now. We returned to town, and for the first time in months, I felt a sense of peace. Elroy was gone, but I had faced my fear and survived. The people in town still whispered, but now there was a note of respect in their voices. They didn't know the whole story, but they knew I had faced something terrible and come out the other side. Life went on. I kept working at the gas station, but I also started learning more about my heritage, about the old ways and the stories that had been passed down through generations. Caleb became a mentor to me, teaching me the rituals and protections that had kept our people safe for centuries. I never went back to that mine, but I knew that the desert held many secrets, and that the Yenaldushi was only one of them. I stayed vigilant, always aware of the thin line between our world and the world of spirits.